podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stamp here. Thanks so much for tuning in. Listen, I want to ask you a question. What is the one thing you could not survive this pandemic without? Like, what is the one thing you needed so bad almost every day and it has gotten you through this? Because I'm going to guess that the answer to that question starts with an N and ends with an Netflix. Netflix. See what I did there? Look, I mentioned that because Netflix is at the core of our interview today. And they're also at the core of so much of our lives. They are really integral into many of our daily routines. And so it begs the question, how do they do it? How have they become part of so many of our lives? How have they maintained their dominance? And perhaps most importantly, how have they continued to transform themselves in an ever-changing industry to stay at the top of their game. You know, they're in this wild, wild west of streaming content creation, and it wasn't always that way. If you're old enough to remember, it was a mail-order DVD subscription service. But Netflix has been able to not only survive, but thrive, and it's all due to their culture. This week on the show, we are interviewing Aaron Mayer, And Aaron is the author of the book, No Rules, Rules, Netflix, and the Culture of Reinvention. And what's really cool is Aaron wrote this book alongside Reed Hastings, you know, the founder of Netflix. And now Aaron's specialty really is in corporate culture. And she wanted to work with Reed to understand how has Netflix built this culture that allows them to continually reinvent themselves and go from this mail-order DVD company to a production company, essentially. We'll touch on very specific things in this episode, things that we all deal with, things like how to give feedback and why that's so important to a culture, how to continue to change and grow, how to improve, innovate, and be creative, things we can all use, whether we're running a company or just a cog in a machine. So I thought this would be a great one for you. Plus, I love Netflix, and this book is no slouch. Listen to this. This book has nearly 2,000 ratings on Amazon. It has four and a half stars, and it is a number one bestseller. That is a big deal. So I mentioned our guest this week is Aaron Mayer. Aaron is a professor at INSEAD, one of the leading international business schools. Prior to that, she was a director of training and development at HBOC and a director of business operations at McKesson Corporation. In 2019, Aaron was listed by the Thinkers 50 for the second time as one of the 50 most impactful business writers in the world. Before we turn it over to Aaron, a couple things. Remember, we're at smartpeoplepodcast.com. Check us out. Sign up for the newsletter there. Don't forget to support us on Patreon and get some stuff, right? So patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast, two to five bucks a month. Not only do you get ad-free episodes and support the show, which is awesome, but we can become friends. And just as much, you can ask our guests questions. You could have asked Aaron something about how to build your culture, how to be a better leader, something about Netflix, whatever you want, right? Patreon.com slash smart people podcast. All right, let's get into it as we talk to Aaron Mayer about her book, No Rules, Rules, Netflix and the Culture of Reinvention. Enjoy. Well, Aaron, first, I just want to say thanks so much for being on the show. I'm very happy to be here with you. It's fun to connect halfway across the world. And, you know, we finally get all tech issues worked out. So we are we're good to go and good to share this uh, with our audience. You recently wrote a book, No Rules Rules, uh, Netflix and the Culture of Reinvention. And what I want to start with is 
Why Netflix? Oh, yeah. Well, Netflix is a is a particularly interesting company when you're looking at corporate culture. So I'm an expert on culture in the workplace. I'm a professor at INSEAD, which is this business school outside of Paris. And my first book, The Culture Map, was all about national cultural differences at work. Um, but I become increasingly interested in corporate culture. And the reason that Netflix interested me is that it's managed to do something as an organization that is very, very rare, which is that they've meant, okay, they're incredibly successful. We all know that, right? But mm. beyond that, that's not the really interesting part. <laughs> the really interesting part is that they've managed to reinvent themselves as an organization uh, multiple times in just a decade or so, right? So if you think about it, it wasn't long ago that Netflix was a DVD by mail company, right? So they had mm -hmm. these uh, they had these um, sites where they had you know hundreds or thousands of DVDs that they were putting in the mail and sending them out to their customers by post, right? And then, of course, the environment shifted and Netflix shifted also from being a DVD by mail company to being a streaming company. Company, right now, they're a high tech company, streaming rerun television shows and movies out to their uh, out to their customers. And then the environment shifted, and Netflix they reinvented themselves. They became a, a multimedia company, right? A media company with their own studio, hiring their own actors and directors, competing with Disney. <laughs> Uh, to uh, be an entirely different type of company than what they'd been just a few years before. I think this is a particularly interesting topic right now, of course, in our, our moment of COVID, because uh, we all are thinking about how we can uh, build our organizations to be more reactive and flexible. And that's certainly what was interesting to me about this company. And beyond that was the fact that, that Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, um, he attributed the success in reinventing themselves to the fact that they had this very strong corporate culture that was all about flexibility. So that that's how I became interested in the project. I love it. And I want to start here with this because I think many people think this way, and I definitely am guilty. When I think of Netflix, I think of what it is today. And I think that that was just a natural progression, right? Because as consumers, we very quickly adapt to our environment and think that's just the way things were. So yes, Netflix was a DVD by mail, but it just made sense that they were going to stream it to you. That's just technology. And then once they started doing that, they realized, hey, look, we can also create our own content because, I mean, everybody's doing it, YouTube and social media. So from the outside perspective and perhaps a very naive view, it seems not that special, right? Like they had a bunch of money. I think the initial idea of DVD by mail, fantastic, but where they've gotten to, eh, natural progression. Tell me why that line of thinking is wrong and how difficult it is for a Netflix or for anybody to truly make these, we can call them leaps, but from an outsider perspective, it just seems natural. Yeah, but almost every company, um, they they build their organization with a certain uh, a certain framework in mind. And as they build the organization, they put all of the infrastructure in place. They put all of the processes and systems in place so that their company can run, right? Uh, so then when the environment shifts, suddenly they have to figure out like, okay, I'm, I'm anchored over here. I'm in the North Pole but I have to be in China. Right? So how am I going to kind of like uproot the company, change directions and move? And, you know, that is incredibly rare, a company that's that's able to do that. We start out the book, No Rules Rules, talking about this uh, now, I guess, uh, famous moment in history of when, uh, when Reed, Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph tried to sell Netflix to Blockbuster. And, you know, Blockbuster, of course, is a perfect, example of that, they understood that the environment was changing. They understood that they were going to need to move from a, from a physical movie company to a streaming company, but they couldn't do it. And most companies just can't. They're just not flexible enough. So that's what I wanted to figure out with Netflix. I wanted to understand what it was about this organization that allowed them to be so flexible that they could suddenly see, oh, you know what? Instead of running south, we're going to run northeast. And they could just pick up and change direction quickly. Mm. And 
what you really dove into and what it what comes of this is the idea of culture. And I, culture is another one of those things. Perhaps it's just me because I'm in that space, but it seems like this buzzword, right? Everybody's focused on culture. We all know it. It's almost, I almost don't like saying it anymore, but this is your world. This is where you live and you've done it for quite some time. So let's take a step back and say, you know, what is it about culture that's important and perhaps even define it for us first? Yeah. So I'm going to speak specifically about organizational culture, uh, which is uh, different from national culture that we can do later on in in another call. But organizational culture is the personality of a company. Right. So um, I define culture overall as the personality of a group. Right. So in the same way that you can define an individual's personality, you can define a group's a group's personality. Right. So um, we all when we join a company or we join an organization, we recognize that there is a personality that is that is specific to that group that we are working with. And what's remarkable about Netflix is that they have managed to articulate a counterintuitive, um, I think in some ways shocking (laughs) corporate culture and actually have it take root in the organization in a way that is quite unusual. And they've done that because in most companies, when they try to identify corporate culture, uh, they speak in absolute positives. Like, you know, most companies, they say our corporate culture is about integrity or about um, about respect, um, but there's no like real good options to integrity or respect. So I think when you speak in those absolute positives, they don't necessarily lead to those words taking root in the organization. But mm-hmm. at Netflix, they've looked at the tensions that their employees face on a day-to-day basis and they've told their employees, you know, when you when you come across these two good options, turn right. In other words, um, when you come across the option of either being um, valuing organizational transparency or individual privacy, uh, value organizational transparency. Right. So they've looked at those kind of like tough dilemmas and they've told the, the, their employees which way to turn, which is what I believe has led to this, um, this very effective building a culture with intention. I like the way you put that, right? Because it takes a little bit of the, I don't want to call it mystery out of it, but to your point, when you see, we want to be a culture of integrity, like, of course, who's going to say we don't want to be that? So it's, it's, it needs to be more prescriptive than that. We need to be able to do something with those words that help us in a day-to-day basis. And I'm, I'm also curious, what are some examples, given all of your study, of companies that have not been able to focus on that? Like, let's take the opposite of Netflix. What are some things that you've seen companies do wrong so we can be aware of those in our leadership roles or whatever we do on a day-to-day basis? Yeah. Okay. So before I I start diving into this, let me say that what I was studying at Netflix is how to build a corporate culture that breeds innovation and flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really critical because what I found is that most organizations today are operating with this kind of industrial era hangover. (laughs) And what I mean by that is that their corporate culture is built around these principles of error prevention replicability and consistency, which were the big, the big needs during the industrial era. Of course, if you are running a manufacturing plant, you know, minimizing error and making sure that every one of your products is exactly the same, that's your overwhelming goal. But in today's world, and of course, there are still some companies where that's the goal, right? Error prevention and replicability. But in today's world where things are changing so fast and we need to be more innovative, more quickly, there's a growing number of organizations where the goal really is, you know, how can we innovate faster And how can we be more flexible? And that's what I was looking for at Netflix. I was looking for what kind of corporate culture was needed in order to put those things in place. And that's really what, what I, what I found and what we wrote about in the book. Yeah. And that makes sense. One thing I will say to that is, would you agree that almost every company, I mean, literally almost everyone, let's call it 90% need to be moving towards a culture that fosters innovation and flexibility simply because the rate of change 
the pace of growth, the globalization, companies who are not able to pivot and be flexible and all that simply can't last the same way they could maybe 30, 40 years ago. Well, I think that's uh, true, but I also believe you have to recognize in order to have a culture of innovation, you cannot focus on error prevention as your overriding goal. And of course, there are some areas, some, some industries, some departments where error prevention is the focus. I mean, if you are working in a safety critical market, if you are running a mine, for example, your goal is that no one gets hurt. And that is more important than innovation. Right. Uh, and I think we can look at, for example, I've been working with the company Michelin Tires, and that's a, a safety critical industry. They have, um, you know, manufacturing plants, they build tires. And I think we all can pretty well hope that in those tire plants, error prevention is their number one goal, you know, not innovation. That being mm. said, in other parts of Michelin, there are, you know, teams of people who are trying to think of, you know, crazy new ways to create the tires of the future. So um, I think we can really think about, you know, in our organization, what am I valuing here at this moment? Is it more important to be innovative or is it more important to prevent error? And if your goal is to prevent error, don't read our book. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Here's why this is fascinating. Personal bend here, right? Most people know this, but a few months ago, I changed um, companies and I now do leadership development at Nestle. Clearly, the number one focus of a company whose product goes in your body is things like safety, consistency, right? That's, that's very obvious. However, we also know in our industry, we have to be innovative because, you know, it's, it's one where a mom and pop in a garage can create the next best chocolate chip or a hot pocket or whatever it might be. So how does a company like maybe Nestle or you just mentioned tires how can they be successful at making sure that first and foremost, they have that consistency and safety, but they can also keep up with the smaller companies, the startups, the competition by being flexible. It seems like that's an extremely difficult task because you're asking for almost two cultures to, to combine. Yeah, but I think once you're aware of what kind of culture you need for innovation and flexibility and what kind of culture you need for error prevention and replicability, then you can really, with intention, kind of rope off uh, various areas of your company with different goals in mind. And I think, you know, that's what I with, what I wanted to do with this book is really get people thinking, okay, you know, in this area, we're going to turn left and in this area, we're going to turn right. And I do think this can be done not not just company by company, but also department by department. That, there we go. That's what I was wondering. I was wondering if it's possible, you know, or how, let me, let me rephrase this. How important is it for a company, you know, the entire thing, let's look at the entirety as opposed to individual departments within it, the company to set the standard and cascade it down, or can you have individual operating <laughs> kind of things with slightly overriding cultures. Maybe it's kind of like, as we look at the US, right? You have the federal government kind of sets the overriding, but then state governments, which can work on a local level. Yeah, that's right. And my goal, my goal with all of this was to give tools, not just to CEOs, but really to anybody who was leading a team uh, to think about how to lead that team in the way that they could get the innovation and flexibility that they were going, they were going for. Well, there you go. You just hit the nail on the head. I heard a collective, you know, tens of thousands of leaders and managers and all that across the world. Ears perk up and say, great, how do I do it? So let's start there. Um, what can we as leaders glean from Netflix that we can instill in our teams at our local level to improve things like flexibility and especially innovation. Yeah, so I think in order to start that, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. And this is a story uh, that that Reed, Reed Hastings, told me when I first started working with him uh, to get ready for, for this book that we co-authored. And the story was about his um, his first company before Netflix, which is a company called Pure Software. And when Reed opened up uh 
Pure Soft. It was just a, you know, a small entrepreneurial company, a small group of people that were running, let's say, fast and loose. Uh, so what I mean by that was that there were no, you know, rules or process telling people uh, what they could and couldn't do. People were just using their best judgment to uh, move the company forward. And then the company started to grow, right? It grew to a couple of hundred people, a couple of thousand people. And as it grew, some people did stupid stuff and some people took advantage of the freedom that was allotted to them. So, for example, there was this guy named Jim who used to fly every week from San Francisco to L.A. And because there was no travel policy, he started flying first class every week. Right. Why not? He was more comfortable. And there was this woman named Charlotte, and she used to bring her dog to work every day. I mean, there was no policy against it. And one day that dog uh, chewed a big hole in the carpet at work. And as these things happen, you know, Reed was frustrated, like that was a big waste of money, right? So he um, he sat down with HR and they started to create rules. They created a, a detailed travel policy telling people how they could and couldn't travel. They created an employee handbook book, one of the rules, no dogs at work. Right? Mm. Um, but then as the company grew and these processes, and they also put in place management processes like um, management by objective and annual bo- uh, key performance indicators and annual bonus processes, right? To make sure that people were, let's say, doing what they should. Right. Um, But then something else started to happen, which is that the really like creative mavericky people in the company, they started to leave. They left the organization so they could go work in places that were, um, let's say, were more entrepreneurial, places that they could run free. And as they did that, the organization stopped innovating to the point that he, that Reed actually had to purchase other companies that were innovating, which created more complexity, which led to more rules, which led to more innovative people leaving. And ultimately, the people who were really good at following those processes, they were promoted into senior management management, right? And then at one point, the company uh, needed to change direction, in this case, from C++ to Java. But the people who were leading the company were not the most flexible people. And they were because they were like really good at rule following, right? Um, And the company was unable to change direction. So Reed had to sell the company. And it was with um, with that lesson in mind that he opened up Netflix and his his Mm. overriding messages where, you know, number one, employee freedom breeds innovation. And number two, organizational pr- process kills flexibility. And so th- those were kind of like the, the learning. And I think that's the overall learning for managers is they're trying to think about how to create an innovative, innovative environment. I love that. Now, one thing that keeps jumping out to me, and I want to get into the specifics of Netflix, but in your experience, And in my experience, it would seem this way that when a company starts with these principles, it is far easier to continue than to change them in the middle, right? And that is, I think, one of the biggest problems, especially for established companies is, or even managers who have established teams is saying, we realize the need to change, but overcoming the inertia, the way things have always been. Do you believe that to be true? And if so, what advice can you give to those managers, those leaders, those companies who are actually trying to change the paradigm, change the culture from what it used to be to what it needs to be? Yeah. So of course, the the bigger your company, the the more you've been following a certain way of working, the more difficult it is to let's say, change the personality of the company. But um, Reed and I, when we wrote No Rules Rules, we wrote it, um, let's say, kind of as a handbook, right? And we tried to write it um, in lots of little steps to get people to think, you know, um, I can't change the whole thing in one, one breath, but I can make a small step forward in this direction and a little step forward in this direction. And then that will lead to a, an, a little bit of an advantage, step by step by step. And I really think that we could do that in, in, you know, a team of three or a team of 3000, uh, mm-hmm. depending on, on what our goals are. Got it. You mentioned something there that triggered, and I realized this as I was researching, but I don't think it really sunk in. You wrote this alongside Reed and Reed to many people these days is somewhat of a, 
you know, not just cultural icon, but a hero, right? Um, especially to me as a parent. I mean, when I can turn on Netflix for my kids, like read, you're a hero. So number one, how did you meet him? And then number two, I'd love to know what are the one or two most important things you learned from him while co-authoring this? Yeah. So yeah, Reed and I actually met each other in kind of an unusual way. So uh, my first book, The Culture Map, came out in uh, spring of 2014. And uh, it, now a lot of people are reading it, but at the beginning it was very quiet. So mm -hmm. probably because of that, that I was so surprised when I woke up one morning and I opened up my email and there was an email, uh, an email in my inbox that um, was titled, the subject was Peace Corps. And the email then said, um, hi, Erin, um, my name is Reed. I was a volunteer teacher in the Peace Corps in Africa near where you were. Um, I am now the CEO of Netflix. I loved your book. I'm having my leaders read it. Hope we can meet sometime. So, so wow. that was the, the beginning of our collaboration. I have to tell you, I wasn't sure if the email was real at first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had showed it to my husband. Do you think it's really him? <laughs> wow. um, yeah, so then I started working with Netflix as they were getting ready for their, their big international expansion in 2016, helping them think about how to uh, roll out their uh, surprising and edgy corporate culture in various parts of the world. And eventually we, just started, we started to discuss this book. And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. The new year is here, and it marks a fresh start for your small business. Whether you're shifting business hours or hiring more remote employees, one thing that remains unchanged is the importance of having the right people on your team. When your business is ready to make that next hire, LinkedIn Jobs can help by matching your role with qualified candidates so you can find the right person quickly. In my opinion, there's no better way to hire for a specific role if you know exactly the skills you're looking for and you can find the person that matches those skills. LinkedIn is an active community of professionals with more than 722 million members worldwide. Getting started is easier than ever with new features to help you find qualified candidates quickly. Post a job with targeted screening questions and LinkedIn will quickly get your role in front of more qualified candidates. Manage job posts and contact candidates from a single view on the familiar LinkedIn.com as functions are streamlined onto one simple screen. And now you can do this all from your mobile device, no matter where the day takes you. That's how LinkedIn Jobs can help you hire the right person faster. Visit linkedin.com slash smart to get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash smart to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. And now back to the episode. What's Reed like? I mean, what did you learn from him? It sounds like just from his initial email, that sounds very down to earth, right? But, I mean, because you know, these these CEOs, these uh, creative entrepreneurs, they get this halo, especially in, in this, you know, in this day and age. Um, what's it like to work with him? And what did you learn from him specifically while writing this? Yeah, so um, Reed has a different image of a CEO than most companies do. And I think that actually kind of leads into talking about the model that we, that we present in the book, which is that um, most organizations are run like a pyramid, right? Where you have like the CEO at the top, let's say that the decision-making system is like a pyramid where you have the CEO at the top of the pyramid. And then you have the lower level workers that are towards the bottom, <laughs> Right? And the lower level workers, of course, they can make small, unimportant decisions, uh, but anything that's important or expensive gets pushed up uh, up the, the pyramid. Uh, at Netflix, they say something called lead with context, not control. And what we see with that system is leadership being more like a tree. And with the, with the tree metaphor, what you see is that the, the chairman of the company, um, she or he are down there like in the, in the dirt at the roots of the tree. Those are the people who are setting the, the context for the organization, talking about you know, which way the company needs to go, what are the things they need to be thinking about as decisions are made? Then you have the, the senior managers who are like at the big, the big trunks, the roots of the, the, the big branches of the tree, setting more context about their own departments. But then you have the lower level managers that are really, let's say, at the, 
at the outer, the outer leaves, the outer branches of the trees. And those are the real decision makers. Those are the ones who people who are thinking about all the context who was set by the leaders, let's say above or below them, right? Um, and taking into account all of that context, making the big important decisions for the organization. So Reed sees himself not as a gatekeeper, which is what we have in most organizations, you know, an approver of decisions, but of a gardener, right? Someone who's sitting there making sure that the, that the conditions of the soil are, are just right. And um, I think that that, of course, does give one a very humbling type of, of ethos <laughs> mm-hmm. when you're leading an organization. And yeah, I would say he's quite down to earth. So you mentioned the, the model that you came up with, and I want to spend a decent amount of time talking through that model. So could you give us a high level overview of what that model is, what we can take from it, and then we'll dig into specific pieces. Yeah. So um, as I said earlier, when Reed started Netflix, he had the goal of creating an organization that had very low rules and very little process. He wanted to give his employees a lot of freedom, but he also recognized that in doing so, um, there was a big risk. Because as companies grow larger, if you don't put in place rules and process, then the company is likely to descend into chaos, right? So he tried to think about, you know, how he could do this without rules and process. And the first thing that occurred to him is that um, in most organizations, the rules and process are put in place in order to deal with like the mediocre employees, right? The the really top notch employees, the best the best uh, talent, they don't need many rules and process. So his thought was, what if I were to create an organization that was made only of top employees? In that case, I could give employees a lot more freedom, which would breed more innovation and flexibility. Right. Um, but that being said, even even top employees may try to cheat the system or take advantage of the freedom that's given to them. Um, how will I deal with that? And then he thought about this idea of trying to create a, a culture in the organization where there was a lot of candid feedback that was given from one employee to another and from employees up to their boss. So in doing so, there would be this kind of co-accountability. If someone tried to take advantage of the freedom that was allotted to them, someone else would say, hey, you know, that's not okay. That's not in the best interest of the company. Um, So his experiment was if we have the top talent and we have a lot of candor, then perhaps I can have an environment where we have a huge amount of employee freedom. And that's what we can say, I guess, is the the, the Netflix experiment, and um, and you know what I was studying throughout the whole book, how to put those those three those three elements in place: first, the talent density, then the candor, and then releasing management controls to get innovation. Here's what I love, and here's where I'm skeptical. Right, um, I love this idea as somebody who wrote off the corporate environment at 25 and just now came back. I have not worked for a large company in over a decade for the specific reason that I do not do well with micromanagement oversight. I like the entrepreneurial environment. So love that piece. Now, here's the skepticism that I know you've already heard, so I can't wait to learn about it is easier said than done. And let me just take some examples, okay? Um, Or some ideas that I'm very curious about. Feedback and candor, is something that everybody wants, or at least that's what I'm hearing, but it is extremely difficult to implement. So let's say uh, we, we're not at Netflix, but we're taking this lesson and we want to increase this feedback and candor. How do we actually get people to do it? And, and I mean like on a larger scale, right? So if I have a team of three, I'm pretty sure I can say, hey, look, like I'm going to tell you straight, you tell me straight. And then when they do tell me straight, I just react in a way that reiterates the fact that they can talk to me straight. But how does a company really instill this at a, at a macro level and make it not just a nice buzzword, but something that people feel free and almost compelled to do? 
Yeah. So at Netflix, there are, I would say, three critical points. And they are, I mean, I know everyone's talking about candid feedback, but yeah. I have some stories I could tell you. I'm sure. They are really oh. candid at Netflix. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not like an ordinary amount. Okay. So that starts in a couple of different ways. Um, but the, the most interesting, I think, is if you really want to get this kind of um, feedback going in your organization, you have to start by getting people to give feedback to the boss. Right, that's number one. And that's, of course, the most difficult part, right? I mean, okay, it's not so difficult for the boss to give feedback to the employee. Already a little difficult, but to get the employees to give feedback to the boss, that's the most critical. So what I saw at Netflix, and, and Reed, um, Reed models this, but then the, the leaders underneath him follow it, is that uh, you need to ask for feedback consistently you need to um, have it built into your meetings that your employees are giving you feedback. And then when you get that feedback, you need to tell everyone what feedback you got. And the more negative it was, the more excited and pleased you need to be about it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so like when I worked with Reed, one thing that would happen <laughs> frequently would be that like he spoke at one of the leadership meetings and Someone, I don't know, four or five levels below him in the organization sent him an email giving him feedback about what they didn't like about his presentation. And he sent it to me right away. He's like sharing it with everybody. So I think that that's really critical. Of course, as leaders, it's very easy to feel defensive or upset when we get feedback from our teams. But if anyone kind of smells that you're, uh, that you're not actually wanting it, then they're definitely not going to give it. Um, the Damn. other couple of points are just, well, one of them is quite simple, which is putting feedback on the agenda. So most people will not give feedback to their colleagues unless they feel that they have a, a, um, the right moment to give it. Uh, so at Netflix, you walk into the, a meeting in the morning and you often will see like 10 o'clock feedback with Jane. Right. And you know that then Jane's coming to your office and she's going to ask you for some feedback about how to improve her performance. And then she's going to give you some feedback about how to improve your performance. Right. Mm -hmm. um, often on their uh, monthly one on ones or even weekly one on ones, uh, feedback is the last item or the first item of the agenda. So people just get into the habit of recognizing when we schedule a meeting, we have to make sure that we have the time to give one another feedback. Just that simple step starts to get a lot of the feedback out there. They also yeah. do something at Netflix that I thought was totally crazy when I first started working with them. They do this thing that they call um, these feedback dinners, the, these 360 feedback dinners. And a 360 feedback dinner is basically that you maybe once a year, you and your team go out for a meal and um, you go around the table. And so like if I'm up first, right, um, we go around the table and everybody at the table tells me something that they think that I should do, could do in order to improve my performance. Right. And, you know, when I and then then when they're done, you go on to the next person. <laughs> So when I first heard this, I thought, oh, my gosh, that's crazy, right? Like, what's the point to drag, uh, drag these weaknesses out publicly? Yeah. But can you imagine? But I, no. But I thought it actually created this really interesting mechanism, which is that when people go into those, those dinners, they recognize they're there to help one another. They have to be very thoughtful and they have to be ready to give and receive the feedback. And you learn when you get feedback from eight people, what are the real things you need to be working on? Not just that that one guy, Pedro, thinks that I'm obnoxious or something like okay. that. Okay, Aaron, I have to pause you here because that is something I, I've been like chomping at the bit since we got on this to, to discuss because I struggle with this. When one person gives me feedback, I don't care if it's a boss. I don't care if it's somebody I lead or just a coworker, colleague, it doesn't matter. I'm always like, I feel I'm open to it. If it's obvious, they say it and I kind of knew deep down that it was feedback I needed. Great. Let's, you're right. Let's move on. But oftentimes I get feedback on things that I disagree with. This is why I'm doing it. And when it's one person, I always question one, the impact of that feedback. Two, are they even right? And then three, maybe it's just the way they interpret this, but the other thousand people I impact don't. So 
that's where I was going to go with this. If we keep encouraging these one-on-one feedbacks, does it also encourage the idea that you have to act on all of these things? <laughs> yeah, well, thankfully not. So, so you're right. <laughs> um, at Netflix, uh, they people talk a lot about how feedback should be done, and I kind of summarized it in these these four A's. So, in order to do feedback right, um, number one, the feedback needs to aim to assist. So it shouldn't be given just to get like frustration off my chest. Um, I have to do it really with the intention of helping you out. So that's the first A. The second A is that it has to be actionable. If I don't see clearly what you could do to change it, then I, I don't give it, right? It has to be clear what you could do differently to improve. Um, the third point is that when you get the feedback, you need to show a you need to appreciate to show appreciation, and that's of course critical because uh, despite what you've just said, most people when they get negative feedback or criticism about their work, their amygdala starts sending off an alarm. Right? The amygdala is of course the most primitive part of your brain, and one of the things that the amygdala is really focused on is finding safety in numbers right? It does not want to get kicked out of the tribe, which would lead to death historically, right? So Mm -hmm. if you start telling me what you don't like about my work, my amygdala starts screaming, you know, oh, maybe I'm going to get kicked out of this, this, this team. So we react with fight or flight. Either we defend ourselves. It's not true, right? Or we flee. We think I'm never going to talk to that person again, Right? So that's why we have the third A, which is that when you get the feedback, you have to take a deep breath, ignore your amygdala and say, thank you very much. I appreciate the feedback. But the fourth A is exactly what you're saying, which is that at, at a place uh, where feedback is really the superpower, you're going to get a lot of feedback, but you can always accept or decline. I don't mean you have to do it publicly, like, thank mm-hmm. you, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you just say thank you. And then later on, it's up to you what you act on and what you don't act on. And everybody knows, you know, it's my responsibility to give feedback to somebody if I think it can help them. But that doesn't mean that they will use the feedback that I give them. That's up to them. Mm. And that's the key part. Because I was thinking, imagine this story you told about Reed and the talk he gave and he got an email, right? So Reed's up there saying, everybody give me feedback. And let's say he gets a couple emails. And then he decides this is not good feedback. It's not helpful. I don't agree, et cetera. Then he goes and gives another talk, does the same thing. And the people go, I just told him I didn't like that. Yet he did it again. Therefore, although he talks about feedback, he doesn't actually do anything with it. And and that can become problematic. So I guess your point is we can give it as long as the understanding is, look, take it or leave it. This is just my opinion. Is that fair? That's totally fair. And that's also then, as you said, what makes those 360 dinners so interesting because when you go around the 360, when you go around the team, then, you know, I don't know, Joelle tells me that she thinks I speak too loud. And Mm -hmm. then um, Peter next to her says, well, you know, I know Joelle just said you speak too loud, but I actually love the fact that you give so much energy to the team. Please don't change that. What I think you need to work on is. So the team starts to get a complete picture about what each individual is working on, what others think each individual should be working on. And then it's all up to the individual. Yes. I love that. I love that. I wish more of that was done because I don't have a problem. Six. I actually want to know. I mean, this is, we talk about blind spots. I teach blind spots in one of this thing. And the thing about blind spots is, do you want to be the person that knows less about you than everybody else? Right. And of course not. That's what a blind spot is. The problem is, though, I want to know that multiple people see it and not just one, because then it's just an opinion. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. But I think I also need to stress because feedback has become such a popular buzzword today and everyone's Mm -hmm. on and on about the good of feedback. I mean, Mm -hmm. feedback is pretty startling if you actually start to give it and receive it as you feel things. And I had this very interesting example the first time that I was giving a presentation way before the book at Netflix. 
So I was speaking at their leadership conference. It was a conference in Cuba and there were about 500 people in the audience and I had an hour and a half with them. And, um, you know, I was up on stage, things were going really well. And then I I thought things were going very well. (laughs) Then I came down from the stage um, while they were having short discussions in small groups. And there was one woman on the, on the, in the group who was speaking in this really animated way to her colleagues, like waving her arms. And I noticed her. And when she saw me looking at her, she um, beckoned me over. So I came over and she said to me, you know, like right there in front of her colleagues, she said, Erin, I got to tell you, the way you're facilitating the discussion from the stage is really undermining your point. Because you're talking about cultural diversity, but then you're asking for volunteers and only the Americans are raising their hand. This is just the kind of thing you told us not to do in your book. I hope you'll find a way to improve it. Now, you know, imagine how I how I felt getting this feedback, right? Like here I am, it's right in the middle of my keynote. Never before has this happened to me. And not only that, she gives it to me in front of like six other people, right? So my amygdala started screaming, right? Like, oh my God, you are failing, right? Um, But then I had about two and a half minutes before I had to go back on stage, right? And I I recognized as soon as she said it and my amygdala quieted down, she is right. It was clear to me. Oh, she's absolutely right. Why had that not occurred to me? And I had two and a half minutes. I kind of went into this like deep meditative state. Right? I thought about how to, how to organize the facilitation differently. I went back on the stage, the stage and three minutes later, I did it country by country to make sure that I heard from every nationality present, right? And I actually think that that woman saved my presentation, right? So speaking about blind spots, but here Mm. we have something that's really quite unusual. This woman stuck her neck out in front of her group, right in the middle of my keynote. That kind of thing is very, very unusual. I genuinely know what you mean now about the amygdala because, you know, I've done facilitation for years and I... I without even realizing and I put myself in your shoes, like, and my body started, I got that anxiety feeling. You like I genuinely got it. And, and it, it wasn't even me, you know what I mean? But I can imagine that. And so it just proves how powerful our response can be to, I mean, what is it about feedback? It's, it's being wrong. It's, what is it that makes it so difficult? Yeah, well, you know, hum- human beings are very, very focused on being accepted by their peers. Um, and when we feel we're not accepted, most of us, I mean, despite all this talk about feedback, most of us would would often prefer not to know what people are saying about us. But I think we can yeah. see with this kind of situation that when we get the feedback, when we dare to create an environment where people are courageous enough to give feedback and to re- uh to receive it openly, that we can really get a lot better, both as a team and an organization. And now a quick word from one of this week's sponsors. This week's episode is brought to you by NetSuite. If you're a business owner, you don't need to tell us that running a business is tough, but you might be making it harder on yourself than necessary. Don't let QuickBooks and spreadsheets slow you down anymore. It's time to upgrade to NetSuite. Stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information you need when you need it. Ditch the spreadsheets and all the old software you've outgrown. Now is the time to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more. Everything you need, all in one place, instantaneously. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in revenue, save time and money with NetSuite. Join the over 24,000 companies using NetSuite right now. Let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour at netsuite.com smart. Schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com smart. One more time, that's netsuite.com smart. And now back to the episode. I want to also, there's something that jumped out to me. Um, well, actually, let me, let me, let me pause here. Cause there was something I, else I wanted to cover on this topic of feedback. There is a part in the book where the, the quote is one of the reasons that 
this idea is so difficult in many companies is because business leaders are continually telling their employees, we are a family, but a high talent density work environment is not a family. And what I'm curious about as we're talking about feedback is one of the things I find hard is giving feedback to a boss because that boss can interpret it negatively. And even subconsciously, that can lower their opinion of me as an employee, right? And so how do we fight this? Because let's say that boss is in charge of my trajectory professionally, and they, whether they realize it or not, don't like me simply because I am willing to give feedback. It, it becomes this, mm, you, you see what I'm saying? Like a difficulty where I want to do it, but I'm nervous that it will lower their opinion of me and they might not even realize it and therefore negatively impact my career. Oh, sure. I think it's a very rare person who would actually who actually dares to give feedback to their boss. But uh, we see, a, I saw a lot of it at Netflix because the, the leadership sticks their neck out so far to make it mandatory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they actually have a, a saying at Netflix, which is that if you have um, feedback to give to a leader or disagreement that you are feeling that you think could help that leader or the organization and you choose not to give it, that you are being disloyal to the company, right? right. And, you know, I can actually um, take that back to my collaboration with Reed, which is that um, often I had situations where I would think, gosh, you know, sh should I tell him? <laughs> Should I tell him how what I actually think about this? But I know that when Reed gets feedback, he celebrates that and he considers it to be a big win because it means that his leadership style is working. So because I know that about him, then I say, okay, I'll just go ahead and give it, right? Yeah, it's so leadership heavy and it's also so much on how it's received. It really is. I think that's kind of one of the lessons here. The other thing is you talked about it earlier where you want to create a culture where people can hold each other accountable to some extent. And I know that in the book, you talk about there's no vacation policy at Netflix. And I know that's becoming somewhat of a thing specifically in these startups or Silicon Valley and all that. In my experience, oftentimes what you can then run into is people scared to take that vacation because it is not kind of mandated. Right. So when I'm given four weeks vacation, I know that and I, most good leaders will say, look, that's your four weeks. I take it. You need it. Well, I'm not given any. If I take six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks and you take one, isn't it natural human tendency to say, man, I, that person who takes eight is lazy and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then when I go to hold them accountable, I go up to them and say, look, I noticed you took three weeks off and I, I just think you don't care anymore. Yeah, of course. So um, if let, in order to talk about the vacation policy, let me just take a little bit of a step back, right? So um, so the, the culture at Netflix, as I said earlier, is built on these three principles. So the first principle is increased talent density. So try do everything. We should talk about that afterwards, right? But that's the, yeah. actually the foundation. Do everything mm. you can to make sure that you have the top players in each position. Then build a culture of, of candor which is both organizational transparency and a lot of feedback. And once you have those two things in place, then you can start man uh, then you can start releasing management controls. And uh, management controls fall into three different types of categories. So if we look at like the kinds of, let's say, rules and policy that they have at most companies that they don't have at Netflix, uh, the first category is what you're talking about policies, like vac the vacation policy at Netflix is take some, uh, the, uh, the travel policy at Netflix is behave in Netflix's best interest, uh, the maternity and paternity policy at Netflix is do what's best for you and your family, right? Um, but those, um, that lack of, of uh, policies, those are really sy symbols. Those are symbols uh, that if you tell your employees that you trust them, by, by um, having these lack of policies, then they will behave in a way that's more responsible. Then after that, the, the second category of uh, process or rule that they don't have at Netflix 
has to do with management processes like management by objective or KPIs, uh, annual bonuses. And those are things that we do at most companies to give employees some freedom, but also keep our hands, let's say, like firmly on their shoulders, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the third category, which is the most important one, is no, no approval policies. Sorry, no, no approvals needed. So at Netflix, as we were talking about earlier with the tree, it's the lower level employees that have the power to make the big decisions. And they say things like, don't seek to please your boss, seek to do what's right for the company, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, just to kind of put it in a frame. Um, so yeah, vacation policy, as you said, other companies are starting to do that clearly. And that is, you know, just one, one of the symbols at Netflix. But that doesn't mean that it's just a free for all because we have this concept of lead with context, not control. And that means that in each department and each team, the, the team leader spends quite a bit of time talking about what are the parameters that people should keep in mind when they're deciding how much, uh, how much vacation to take. And of course, then each manager needs to model the amount of vacation they would like their employees to take. So for example, mm -hmm. Reed takes six weeks of vacation a year. And I have to say, I've never seen a CEO who talks so much about the vacations he's been on. Right. So it's through modeling, uh, both setting the context and doing the modeling that people start to understand the soft rules of what's expected of them. And now I'm kind of understanding, I think, what you were talking about, talent density. I want to get into that. And I know you said it's important, but if you have the right people and you set the right environment, and then you have the leaders on a more micro level, kind of reinforcing the micro environment, then it can all work in unison. And what I mean by that is if you have a company full of people who want the best for the company, but are mature enough, are independent enough, et cetera, to take vacation in a way that serves them and the company, it seems like a nice utopia. It's, it also seems very difficult to accomplish, but nobody's saying this is easy. Um, is that part of this idea of talent density? Yes, it's have the, hot, the, the most talent, but it's also these folks can get their work done, but understand how to do it in a way that works for them and Netflix. Yeah, so the most common saying at, at Netflix, the most common a part of their culture is what they call freedom and responsibility. And they use the word so much, they've actually shortened it to F and R. So if you mm. work at Netflix, you're hearing about F and R all the time. So mm. F and R means that each employee has the freedom to make big decisions and make big, big things happen, spend money, take vacation, you know, do whatever they think is best for themselves and the, or for their organization. Um, but they also then are treated like adults. They are responsible for the decisions they make and they are, um, they are judged based on their own judgment. And it's that cycle that then makes the whole system run. Now you mentioned that that is the most important. It is the first pillar. What do you think are the keys to finding those people and, and, and keeping them? I know you mentioned number one, or in the book it mentions, number one is you got to pay them above market. And that seems obvious, but not often uh, done. What else is there that you find so important? And you mentioned we really need to come back to this idea. So I'm curious, um, why is it perhaps the top of the pyramid? And what do you think is most important? about that high talent density? Yeah, so there are two things. Uh, there are really just two innovations at Netflix that are linked to talent density, but these two are critical. So the first one is uh, what they call the rock star principle when it comes to pay. And there's this uh, very interesting research that's been done in the software industry uh, that, uh, that showed, it's been debated, but that showed that one software engineer uh, who is just like, let's say, the best in the field can deliver as much or more value than 10 to 25 medium software engineers. So if you have only a certain amount of money, then you have a choice, right? Either you can hire one person who's, let's say, the best, or you could hire 10 to 25 and pay them you know, like the best, right? Or right. you could um, you could hire 10 to 25 medium employees and spread the money out across them. So the, the first idea to talent density is hire less people and pay them more, 
right? <laughs> okay. mm. So um, that's I, that's simple, but I don't think it's an obvious principle. And that's specifically related to creative jobs. Creative jobs, you want to hire the rock stars and pay them like rock stars. Mm. But more importantly, and of, of course, much more controversially, <laughs> is that they say at Netflix, adequate performance gets a generous severance. And the idea here is that um, each manager should, on a regular basis, you know, think about each person on their team and ask themselves a simple question. This is what they call the keeper test at Netflix. And the keeper test is that, you know, maybe a couple of times a year, you, the manager, you maybe sit down by yourself, go out for a walk, right? And you imagine, you know, if um, if Samuel was coming to me today and telling me that he was going to leave the company to go work somewhere else, would I fight hard to keep him? Would I, mm. would I say, no, Sam, don't leave, right? Or would I maybe be a little bit relieved? Would I maybe be a little bit excited about who I could get into that position? And, um, you know, if you'd be relieved or excited, that's a clear indication that Sam is probably not the right person for that job. And in that mm. case, you have to ask yourself a second question, which is, have I given Sam candid feedback? And if I have, and he still hasn't been able to, to perform, well, that's when adequate performance gets a generous severance. So that brings us back to the idea that you said earlier about thinking about your, your organization like a, a, a high-performing team where people may be swapped in and out on an annual or even you know monthly basis instead of like a family where I'm joining a company for life. And that's what creates that really high talent density. I see. And now, Anne, you put some context to that family for life thing, because for a little bit there, I was getting this sense of militaristic, just fear, militaristic style of leadership. And what I mean, I, I know it, it can seem counterintuitive, you're saying, but there's all this freedom. But it's like, if we're so cutthroat, if we're like constantly trying to trim the fat and do more with less and all these things, it seems scary. But what you mean when you say things like it's not a family or generous severance for adequate performance, all it means is that we want people who are doing good, who are executing, and we will create camaraderie. We will be honest with you and allow you to flourish. We're not trying to scare you or even manipulate you into working harder for fear of not living up to the standard. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I do want to be clear, like working at Netflix is definitely a high adrenaline place. And, you know, mm -hmm. maybe that's why they've managed to move, move so fast and uh, make such a difference. But um, if you think about it, like if you were, let's say, running an Olympic team, right? I mean, what's mm -hmm. your goal? You need to make sure that you have the best people in every single spot. And then you have to make sure that you've got great relationships and that people are working really well together. Right. Mm. And that's where we see this whole idea that performance is contagious. There's actually this uh, this fascinating study that was conducted by this professor named William Phelps, where he invited MBA students into his lab uh, in groups of four. He gave them a task and he rewarded them financially based on how well they did. And unbeknownst to them, in half of the groups, there was an actor named Nick. And Nick had been hired in order to act like a regular MBA student, but to do things that were a little bit undesirable. Like sometimes he acted kind of bored and like put his feet up on the table and texted his mom. And sometimes he acted kind of jerky. Like he might say things like, have you ever even attended a business school class before? And what's remarkable is that you can see on team after team after team uh, that even when the other three three uh, team members were, were top performers, those teams that had Nick on them performed at a 45% greater rate. Um, more interesting than that, you can see that Nick's behavior kind of like bleeds over and they start behaving like Nick. Like when mm. he acts bored, the other people in the team within 30 minutes are all looking at their watches like they're ready to leave. And mm. when he acts jerky, the other team members, they start acting jerky too. And not just to him, but to one another. 
So we can really see this principle play out that on a team, the clearest indication of how well that team will perform is not what the best performer is like, or even what the middle performer is like. It's what the worst performer is like. And that's why I think we can really see, you know, despite the, the, the benefits of creating an environment where we may feel like we have job security for life, you know, if you really want your team to succeed, you have to to create an environment where you've got top performers that are spiraling one another up. I like that. And it makes sense. And I know we're we're over time here. I really only have one last question for you, because as you mentioned earlier, Netflix is this high adrenaline place. We're talking about high performers. There's a lot going on here. And I'm, I'm curious in your research and being around them, two questions. One do you have a sense of what their turnover rate is? Like, do people enjoy this type of environment for a long period of time, right? Not the 23 year old who's there for three years because he can take all that adrenaline and fast pace and, and then goes somewhere else, or do they like to stay there? And then the second, aside from turnover, is just what is your general sense of how people feel long-term about being in this environment? Yeah, well, the number one thing that I heard when I conducted about 200 interviews to get ready for this book with uh, Netflix employees and past employees, and the number one thing that people talk about is that this is the, the best work of their lives. Because never before have they been given this level of autonomy, this level of, of freedom to make a difference. And now that mm. being said, uh, they know the the system when they when they sign up. They've heard adequate performance gets a generous severance. So they may be the kind of people who would prefer to work in a place where they have a huge amount of autonomy and not a lot of a lot of job security. But interestingly enough, I did research that while I was there. The um, the turnover rate at Netflix is just slightly higher than industry. Um, when it comes to voluntary layoffs or voluntary turnover, so people leaving the company on their own, it's significantly under industry level. And when it comes to involuntary people being uh, fired, it's slightly above industry level. So I think mm. you can see actually the dynamic that every company would hope for, which is that right. they're keeping the people that they want. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. the ones that they don't want are the ones that are finding other jobs. That's fascinating. Well, for those listening, we've just scratched the surface. I mean, again, the book is No Rules, Rules, Netflix and the Culture of Reinvention. So if anything you heard here, we talked about feedback and being candid. We talked about high density talent, turnover, innovation, flexibility, changing your company, being a better leader. All these things are covered in vastly more detail in the book. And it takes the shape of obviously the lens, if you will, of Netflix, which is a, a you know a company that everybody is aware of and most people are extremely thankful for. So Aaron, I really appreciate your insight. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, what would you leave anyone listening to this? What would you leave them with as some big lessons that they could go, or maybe one big lesson, they could go implement in their teams immediately? Yeah. So I think on, I mean, my big lesson was, you know, number one, if I want innovation on my team, I shouldn't sit there and lecture my team about being innovative. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, I have to think about, have I created the right soil for innovation? Is the soil fertile? If the soil is fertile, the innovation will happen. And in order to have fertile soil, I have to give a lot of freedom to my employees because freedom attracts the most creative, mavericky people. And when you give a lot of freedom, then people come up with all sorts of ideas. And if I'm going to give my employees a lot of freedom, then I have to make sure I have the best employees. And if I have the best employees, I'm going to have to be really courageous by making sure that I only have the, that I'm always asking myself the question, you know, if this person told me they were leaving, would I fight to keep them? And then I also mm. need to take that extra step of trying to get that candor going. And once I do that, I can get the freedom and then I can get the innovation and flexibility that I'm looking for. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. I love it. It's an inspiring message. It's something we can all take back, focus on that soil. Again, the book is No Rules, Rules, Netflix, and the Culture of Reinvention. 
Aaron, anywhere else you're writing, anywhere else we can follow or you want to plug? So is it social? Where are you active? Yep. Please follow me on LinkedIn um, or go to my website at AaronMeyer.com. And I look forward to being in touch with all of you. It was really a pleasure to be here with you today. I love it, Aaron. Thank you so much. That was our interview with Aaron Meyer. Hope you enjoyed it. And remember her book, No Rules, Rules, Netflix, and the Culture of Reinvention can be found wherever books are sold. All right, time to get through all the quick housekeeping. If you'd ever like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com, message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod, or find us on all the thousands of social platforms that are out there. And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by just leaving a rating or review wherever you downloaded the podcast. Or if you want to support us monetarily, head over to Patreon, patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast. And if you want to stay up to date with all things Smart People Podcast, head over to the website, smartpeoplepodcast.com and sign up for the newsletter. All right. Thanks again for sticking around. And that's it for us this week. Make sure you stay tuned because we've got a lot of great interviews coming up and we'll see you all next episode.